Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Happy February 1st. It looks almost like April 1st outside today. Quite, quite sunny and uh, pleasant, so I hope everybody gets some of that sunshine. I, I wanted to just uh, make a couple announcements before I introduce our very special speaker. And um, uh, essentially, just wanted to remind you that this month we have a slightly different uh, schedule for our, our uh, renal grand rounds. The very last week in February is a uh, health equity week for the entire institution, so we will not be having uh, grand rounds that day. It's uh, all the talks that week will be run through the committee that organizes the health equity speakers, so that's the last week of February. Uh, the week of Valentine's Day, we're actually going to have two renal grand rounds. Uh, we will have uh, Gal Feiner from uh, Pediatric Nephrology present on Wednesday that day. It's going to be in a Lurie Gray seminar room. And then uh, on the 15th, we will have Aline Martin present in this room. Uh, so just look out for uh, the announcements uh, that you, uh, Marissa sends out. Um, and many thanks again to Marissa for making sure you have something to eat and a place to go and uh, listen to the speakers. All right, on to the main event. So we're very lucky today to have a presentation from Dr. Yoni Peleg on membranous nephropathy uh, with a very intriguing title, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. Uh, so we're very eager to hear from him. And a little bit about Yoni. Um, uh, he graduated from University of Southern California uh, with many honors, including summa cum laude, and he was a valedictorian finalist. Uh, he, after that, spent a long time in New York. He did his medical school, a residency, fellowship, advanced fellowship in glomerular nef nef uh, diseases at Columbia University in New York. And if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere, is what they say. So uh, after that, he uh, came here, and he has been on faculty since 2021, and already has uh, received a very prestigious award from uh, the, um, basically, I think the fellows vote on this award, and uh, it's a faculty teaching award for our division. He has also uh, been an attending on the internal medicine uh, residency uh, service and received many, many accolades. I'm going to summarize just a couple of things that the residents said, said about him. They said, I hope Dr. Pellick attends the general medicine floor more often. He's an incredible teacher and has so much knowledge to offer trainees. I appreciate how supportive he was and the learning environment he created. Uh, in addition to his teaching accolades, he also helps us make sure that the trains leave on time in our clinic, especially now that we have uh, many additional clinics that we have incorporated to make sure that the patients can uh, see nephrologists in a timely manner. He also works with our research team uh, on a number of uh, industry-sponsored clinical trials, including a trial focused on membranous nephropathy, which is what he's going to talk about today. And then finally, I'll just add that he is going to assume the reins of being Associate Fellowship Program Director. Actually, that has already happened with yet another transition coming up. So if you can make it in New York, you can make it in Chicago. Thank you very much, Yoni. Thanks. Thanks for that really kind introduction. Um, so I want to thank everyone uh, for coming to today's Grand Rounds. And the title of my talk today is Memorous Nephropathy, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, as Tamara alluded to, I am the site PI for our Bygene-sponsored membranous uh, study. So if you have patients with membranous who you think would be appropriate for study um, Screening, please let myself or Pat Fox know we are actively recruiting. So before I get into the talk proper, I wanted to start with a few cases of membranous I've seen just in my couple years here at Northwestern that I think are representative of the diversity of membranous cases we see in practice. So this first case is a 55-year-old male building engineer who at baseline has normal kidney function, um, no protein on his urine on an insurance exam a couple years prior. But in 2022, he gained 60 pounds of water weight over a relatively short time period. And his primary care physician noted that with the accumulation of fluid, fluid there was a rise in proteinuria and a fall in albumin, 
So he went to the nephrologist close to where he lives, and the nephrologist noticed that the creatinine went up from a baseline of 1.1 to 1.7. The patient had marked nephrosis, very high PLA2R titer, and was started on um, conservative management. So the question that I'm hoping that this talk will get to answer is, does this patient need a kidney biopsy? Should we wait six months to start immunosuppression? Should we start it now? And if so, what do we use? And what do we do if he's refractory? The second case is a slightly younger gentleman um, who's a tax consultant, again, without any significant disease at baseline, either kidney perspective or any other systemic condition, no diabetes, high blood pressure, or anything like else, anything like that. He gained 20 pounds of fluid over three months. He went to the ER a couple of times. Um, they noted some protein on his dipstick and referred him to nephrology. And then when I met him at our initial visit, I noted he had significant nephrosis, preserved kidney function, and a PLA2R in the moderately elevated range. So at this point, I had to ask myself, does he need a kidney biopsy? Should I wait, or should I treat him with immunosuppression now? After discussion, we decided to wait a couple of months. His nephrosis worsened, his PLA2R uh, rose, so what do we do now? The last case is a little bit different from these other two cases. It's a 58-year-old elementary school principal who uh, has, without significant medical disease at baseline, had a leg, some leg injury, which he took, you know, every nephrologist, nemesis, high dose and said, for a couple of months, and during that time developed a frothy urine and a 20-pound weight gain. When I met him, he was uh, nephrotic um, with preserved kidney function. Pan serologies were negative, including PLA2R, which bought him a kidney biopsy which revealed membranous nephropathy with secondary features and a negative antigen screening. So for this patient, do we offer him immunosuppression or do we wait? So I'm hoping through today's talk we'll get to the answer to how to approach these patients. And um, here's an agenda of uh, my goals for today's talk. I'd first like to review the classical approach to membranous nephropathy, how we treat membranous nephropathy yesterday, if you will. And to, then I'd like to switch the bulk of the talk to how we treat membranous nephropathy in really the area we're living in, which is the PLA-2R era. And we can use PLA-2R PLA for diagnosis, treatment decision, and monitoring in terms of how successful our treatment is, and talk about the two main stays of therapy for uh, members of therapy nowadays, which is rituximab, plus or minus calcineurin inhibition, versus the tried and true modified Ponticelli. And then I'll end with a brief word on emerging therapies for resistant membranous treatment and uh, resolve those cases we started with. So starting with the past. Um, membranous nephropathy is one of the most common forms of primary nephrotic syndrome in adults. Obviously, I'm taking diabetes out of it. I'm talking about primary forms of nephrotic syndrome. Second behind only FSGS, actually. 70% um, of membranous cases are primary, meaning they're not associated with another condition. There is a male preponderance in terms of patients who get membranous. Most commonly, it's a, it's a disease in their 30s or 50s. And patients typically have preserved kidney function at the time of diagnosis, which brings, a brings up an important clinical pearl. If you see a membranous patient with an AKI, it's prudent to rule out a bilateral renal vein thrombosis. Membranous is, a, is one of the most prothrombotic nephrotic syndromes out there. So an AKI and a membranous patient should Barco work up to rule out renal vein thrombosis as we see what it looks like here on gross pathology. Now, back in medical school, we learned about the rule of thirds for membranous nephropathy. Um, namely, um, thirds will spontaneously remit, a third will go on to progressive kidney failure, and a third is somewhere in the middle, persistent proteinuria, persistent nephrotic syndrome. Where did this come from? We should always ask ourselves where it came from when we're given a rule like this. So uh, going back uh, to the data, back in 1995, uh, Hogan and colleagues performed a meta-analysis on the number of treatment trials looking at steroids or alkylating agents or observation alone for membranous nephropathy. And the time period was 1968 to 1993. And looking at over um, just under 1,200 patients, they found that a third of the patients in their study went on to kidney failure after 10 to 15 years, including those who didn't receive treatment. They went on to kidney failure about a third of them went on to kidney failure. Going to a more recent paper, when we're looking at the natural history of uh, primary 
memorist nephropathy. Um, we see Polanco and colleagues out of Spain conducted a retrospective multi-center cohort study of 328 patients with nephrotic syndrome secondary to primary membranous. They were all initially treated conservatively, so not with immunosuppression. And among their cohort, 104 out of 328, or about 33%, went on to have a spontaneous remission. It, I will note, though, it took a while for them to get there. It took them about 15 months to get into remission. And then for our last third, we can go to an older New England Journal trial um, back in 1993, where they, looked at case, where they looked at series published from 1974 to 1992 among membranous patients who were only uh, observed with conservative therapy and not given immunosuppression. Only 16% of, of these patients went on to kidney failure, perhaps because they had less proteinuria than some of the other studies. But still, it's worth to note that a third of them remain nephrotic. So that's where our, our, our rule of thirds come from. And the next question we should ask ourselves in terms of thinking about how to treat these patients are how do the patients who remit or stay nephrotic, how do they do over time? So the Toronto group gave us some answers to this question. Um, the, these are from two separate papers out of Toronto. Um, Calderon and colleagues back in 2008 essentially studied gender differences on the rate of GFR decline across various prone area thresholds for three primary GNs or glomerulopathies, excuse me, membranous, FSGS, or IgA. And you can see that for membranous patients who were stable in the partial remission range, they actually had relatively low GFR declines over time. And then the other group out of Toronto, uh, Troinov, back in 2004, wanted to quantify how good a partial mission was in terms of long-term kidney outcomes. And not surprisingly, they found that if you had a partial remit or a complete remit, you did much better in terms of surviving kidney failure over a long time horizon compared to those who never remitted. And the converse of that is also true. Um, in the Polanco study, like we alluded to earlier, the patients who did not have a spontaneous remission a third of them, or, or about a third of them, 30% of them either went on to dialysis or died over study follow-up despite getting immunosuppression. And then for the Toronto study, those who did not go on to have a spontaneous remission, a third of those patients went on to needing dialysis over a 34-month time horizon on average. So we can make some conclusions here. Um, membranous nephropathy is clearly an important diagnosis to make because two-thirds of patients will not have a spontaneous remission, remain nephrotic. And those who remain nephrotic have a significant chance of progressing to renal failure over time. But yesterday, of course, there was only one way to diagnose membranous nephropathy, and that was the kidney biopsy, an invasive procedure we do all the time, but it is an invasive procedure not without complication. Membranous nephropathy Biopsies do give us pretty pictures, and trying not to embarrass myself in front of the pathologists in the room or on Zoom, I'll say that the membranous uh, biopsies on light on the h &E typically give us these thickened, um, uh, rigid GBM capillaries, um, and it's not a diabetic, it's a membranous patient. Those are the two possibilities with these sort of thickened capillaries. On IF, we have granular, IgG-dominant granular capillary staining, and on EM, we see sub-epithelial uh, deposition of these electron dense deposits, which are the immune complexes depositing under the podocyte, which yield a podocyte reaction, essentially diffuse podocyte effacement. Then on silver stain, we see the classic finding of spike and holes. The holes are actually the membranous deposit, or actually the membranous deposits that are silver negative. So they look at like holes on the silver stain. And the spikes are the membrane reaction is sort of absorbing those deposits. So now that we have our three sort of boxes, you know, it's pretty clear that we don't want to give the spontaneous remission patients immunosuppression because they're going to spontaneously remit. It's also pretty clear that the ones who are at high risk for progressive kidney failure, we want to give them something to try and attenuate that course, so we'd want to give them immunosuppression. But how do we know who's going to go to which box? What, how, we, how do we know who is going to go to the spontaneous remission box, who's going to go to the progressive kidney failure box? So in the past, KDIGO um, 2012 helped answer this question, and they recommend offering immunosuppression for patients who had high levels of nephrosis that did not improve after a six-month observation period. So you had to wait six months prior to offering immunosuppression. The exception, of course, were patients who had very severe life-threatening complications of nephrotic syndrome, such as uh, a pulmonary embolism or a rapid decline in kidney function. 
So why do we have to wait six months? Well, recall from the Polanco study and other similar observational studies, it could take a while to get into spontaneous remission. The uh, time it could take is actually up to 15 months to spontaneously remit, which is why KDEGO 2012 recommended that uh, time to wait. But after we decide who warrants treatment, what treatment do we offer? Well, KDEGO 2012 basically gave two main recommendations. They gave the modified Ponticelli regimen, which is an alternating course of an alkylating agent, used to be chlorambucil, now it's cyclophosphamide, alternating with steroids uh, for six months. The other option was calcineurin inhibition. And so where did these recommendations come from? Well, back in 2012, it was already the modified Ponticelli had decades of experience, and we knew that it worked. This is a more recent study of the modified Ponticelli regimen where John colleagues um, looked at um, a number of patients, uh, just under 100 patients or close to 90 patients, with high-risk members to properly defi defined by KDGO 2012 guidelines given the duration of their elevated proteinuria. And those who were treated with modified Ponticelli enjoyed a 70% remission rate. And more importantly, they actually um, were 90 almost 90% dialysis-free over a 10-year follow-up. This is converse to the patients who uh, were treated conservatively, where a third of them went on to needing dialysis over the 10 years. And to this day, actually, this, the modified Ponticelli is the only, and probably, probably because it's been around the longest, is, is the only um, therapy that's been shown to give us this hard outcome benefit, clearly. The other option KDEGO 2012 told us we can use is a calcineurin inhibitor, and in this randomized trial by Praga and colleagues, which was rather small, they showed that there was a really high rate of, um, or there was a significantly high rate of remissions for patients who were randomized to tacrolimus, uh, 19 out of 25. However, something to keep in mind is that relapse with CNI monotherapy is very significant. So 50% patients in this study relapsed after the CNI was peeled off. And overall, 20 to 30 percent of treated, remitted members of property patients may go on to relapse, and it's especially common among CNI monotherapy. The PRAGA study, again, was 47 percent, and the more recent mentor trial, those in the cyclosporin arm, 53 percent of them went on to actually relapse, typically within one to two years of the study, but it can be as soon as a couple of months of um, achieving remission. And while most relapses occur within months to a few years of remission, they can actually occur m much later. So we looked at patients who had a delayed relapse defined as being in stable from remission for greater than five years, and we identified 16 patients followed at the Columbia GN Center who were diagnosed with a relapse a median of, a median of 10 years after being in stable remission. Most of these patients ended up doing very well. Uh, a lot of them went back on immunosuppression and then w were able to get back into remission. And the rate of GFR decline over a long time horizon was quite low. But it's also significant to note that this was following a lot of patients in the pre-PLA-2R era, so we could only diagnose a relapse after it happens. But now we actually have data that we can actually use PLA-2R to predict a relapse before it occurs. And that's useful given how frequently relapse can occur and how long after the initial presentation it could occur also. So in this study by Barbrello and colleagues, it was found that PLA-2R was detectable in 59 out of 134 primary membranous nephropathy patients, a median of 274 days prior to their kidney biopsy. And among patients where baseline proteinuria was available, 9 out of 21 of them actually were turned seropositive before they had significant proteinuria. So PLA-2R emergence actually predates clinical membranous nephropathy diagnosis, which is useful for looking for a relapse before it actually happens clinically. So to summarize the classical approach to membranous nephropathy, historically it could only be diagnosed by a kidney biopsy. Patients who did not remit uh, spon either spontaneously or with therapy, had high rates of renal failure over 10 to 15 years. KDEGO 2012 used duration and height of proteinuria in defining which patients were high risk and should be offered immunosuppression, which was either the modified Ponticelli or CNI. Relapses are actually common and are especially common with CNI monotherapy. So with that, I want to shift over the talk to membranous nephropathy today, which is really defined by the PLA-2R era. So PLA-2R, or phospholipase A2 receptor, was initially described by Beck and colleagues out of Boston in a landmark paper back in 2009. 
It's actually a normal podocyte antigen, but is the culprit autoantigen in 70, 80, 80 percent of cases of primary membrane nephropathy. And it's really, it's really been a game changer for how we deal with primary membrane nephropathy today. We use it for diagnosis. We use it to prognosticate and form treatment decisions. We use it to see how good our treatment is. And also, it's paving the way for the future in terms of developing new novel therapies and clinical trials. So you really just need to do a cursory look through KDGO 2021 to see how heavy KDGO 2021 leads into PLA2 are. For example, it helps to find when we can forego a biopsy and make a non-invasive diagnosis. It also um, is used as a way of incorporating immunologic risk into the patient's overall risk status in terms of whether or not the membrane nephropathy will progress. It can be used to help define when we should start treatment or adjust treatment depending on how the PLA2R trends over time, giving us how often to trend the PLA2R. And if they have very high levels, we should turn it more frequently. And then lastly, for patients that we treat, we, we, can, identi we can use an immunologic remission to help define subsequent treatments. So let's look at the data informing these decisions, uh, these recommendations in KDGO 2021 in turn. So firstly, how is PLA2R helpful for diagnosis? So back in 2018, Bobert and colleagues out of the Mayo were interested in seeing how PLA2R operated as a diagnostic tool. They followed 97 patients with PLA2R positivity and without secondary causes commonly implicated in membrane nephropathy. Among the patients um, with intact kidney function, kidney biopsy showed membrane nephropathy exclusively without an additional lesion that changed management. This is, in, um, con uh, th this is different than the patients who had a lower GFR at enrollment because in a couple of those cases, while membrane nephropathy was always found, there sometimes was an additional lesion that was actionable. In this study, for example, there was one or two patients with tubular interstitial nephritis, and there was one patient with crescentic burden, which uh, may have altered initial immunosuppression decisions. So the authors concluded that among patients with a positive ELISA and a positive immunofluorescent assay, you, and with preserved renal function and no secondary cause, you may be able to forego a kidney biopsy in making a PLA2R positive member nephropathy diagnosis. But the authors did uh, admit that a validation study was needed. And that validation study happened a couple years later um, um, by, again, Bobard and colleagues out of the Mayo, Columbia, and the University Hospital Val de Hebron in Barcelona. 101 patients were included in the final analysis. Now, to be included in the trial, you can have either a positive ELISA, which was greater than 20, or a positive IFA, whereas the previous one, you needed both. and this one, you only needed one. Just like the other trial, you cannot have any secondary condition that could cause a secondary form of membranous, malignancy, dysproteinemia, autoimmunity, and you couldn't be diabetic. And they found something similar. They found that among their patients who met these conditions, had preserved kidney function, a biopsy showed PLA2 or membranous 79 out of 79 times and not show anything else that altered treatment decisions. Conversely, patients with lower kidney function at baseline, a couple of times they did find findings that altered their immunosuppression decisions, such as superimposed acute interstitial nephritis. So the authors essentially concluded that if you have positive PLA2R, preserve kidney function, no secondary condition, no diabetes, you can make a non-invasive diagnosis of PLA2R membranous nephropathy. But it's imperative that we remember the conditions that uh, we can't do this, such as diabetes, and here's why. There have been publications of false positive PLA2R by ELISA, so and, um, uh, specifically among diabetic patients. So in this publication by Hoxha, uh, and colleagues in 2022, they identified a patient with very high ELISA levels. This is, this is a very high cutoff in the high risk category for, um, for KDGO 2012. He also had a history of uh, type 2 diabetes. The patient was biopsied and there was no findings of membranous nephropathy. They exclusively found diabetic nephropathy. So what's going on here? Essentially, when you do a dipper dive into this patient's immunologic profile, you see that the ELISA was positive, but the indirect immunofluorescence was negative. And what they found was, is that the patient actually had an anti-HIS antibody that was interacting with the HIS tag on the PLA2R. When that HIS tag was removed, the PLA2R went away. 
So this is to say that we have to keep in mind of the limitations of when we can use PLA-2R for uh, making a non-invasive diagnosis. And we see it again here uh, out of the uh, Arcana group. They looked at patients, not specifically with diabetes, but they looked at patients who had positive ELISAs and negative IFAs. This is a small number of patients. They looked at a total of over 5,000 patients, only found six of these patients. But of those six, two patients had high PLA-2R titers and no findings of um, membranous, just diabetes. So perhaps if you have discordant ELISA and IFA, particularly positive I ELISA and negative IFA, it's still worthwhile to pursue a kidney biopsy. So what could we conclude from this portion of the talk? So for patients who meet the following criteria, preserved kidney function, no secondary condition, we're allowed to diagnose membranous nephropathy non-invasively with a positive PLA-2R serology. However, if both conditions are not met or there's discrepancy between the PLA-2R titers, particularly if ELISA is positive and IFA is negative, or if the PLA-2R is negative with worsening nephrosis, I still would consider a kidney biopsy. So that's how PLA-2R is helpful for diagnosis. Let's move to how it's helpful to uh, inform immunosuppression decisions. So prior to the publication in KDGO 2021, the, the Mayo Group, uh, DeVrice and colleagues, along with, I think, uh, yes, Dr. Glassick's on this paper as well out of Los Angeles, um, they published a recommendation of following serial PLA-2R PLA serology in guiding their immunosuppression uh, decisions. So patients with the highest level of PLA-2R, they recommended following their PLA-2R actually monthly. And if they had nephrotic syndrome, their PLA-2R level was greater than 204 and going up, they recommend to start immunosuppression. For patients with low to moderate PLA-2R levels, which I write down what they, how they're defined here, and who have nephrotic syndrome, they recommend following the PLA-2R every couple of months, every two months. And again, if the titer is going up, they recommend starting immunosuppression. And they essentially suggest that measurement of the PLA-2R antibody may obviate the need of the wait-and-see approach of KDEGO 2012 and allow for more rapid treatment based on the immunologic profile of the patient. So what was some of the data that sort of backed up these claims? Um, the authors of this study back in 2013 out of KI followed 90 prevalent patients with biopsy-proven membranous and retrospectively quantified PLA-2R antibodies by ELISA. Those with the highest um, tertile PLA-2R would much a baseline after multivari multivariable Cox regression analysis, they found that they were much more likely to reach kidney progression, which they defined as doubling of serum creatinine. Here's another study showing a similar finding. Um, this was a prospective open multicenter study, and they found that among patients with very high levels of PLA-2R, which they defined as greater than 202, they were more likely to reach the endpoint of progressive kidney disease compared to those with lower PLA-2R titers. And this also held true after Cox regression analysis. This is a little bit different. Here we're asking the question, if your PLA-2R is very high, how likely are you to spontaneously remit? The answer is not very likely. So we said that for the general membranous population, we said that there was a third chance they would spontaneously remit. That went down to less than 5% for those with very high levels of PLA-2R. Something that's interesting here, and I didn't circle it, but something that's interesting here is that unlike the prior two studies where the height of the initial PLA-2R informed how the patient was going to do in terms of kidney failure and remission, they didn't find that here. And actually, in a recent publication out of KI reports, they also found that um, when they were looking at how the height of the initial PLA-2R informed time to kidney disease progression or time to remission, they found that after adjusting for covariates, the initial, the, the initial antibody titer actually did not nicely... Um, did not nicely inform how the patient was going to do over time. So... One thing to keep in mind is that, and the authors admit this, is that the patients who had the highest PLA-2R titer were more likely to receive immunosuppression more quickly compared to the ones who had the lower PLA-2R titer, so maybe that clouded things a bit. But I beg the question is, is a snapshot of time enough to make these treatment decisions, or do we really need the PLA-2R followed longitudinally, as DeVrisi uh, sort of suggested? And this paper suggests maybe that's what we need, because Barber and all, 
um, analyze retrospectively the mentor cohort. And they were trying to answer how can they predict who was going to go into remission at 12 months. And they found that the best model for prediction of that was to change the PLA2R, PLA2R antibody level from baseline to three months, as well as a change in the albumin. That was the best way of predicting what was going to happen in 12 months. It was better than their baseline model, which was based on how high the PLA2R was. So we can use PLA2R and trends to help diagnose, to help define who should start treatment if the PLA2R is going the wrong direction. But what about the PLA2R clearance or immunologic remission, which we define as the PLA2R going to zero? Well, we know from multiple studies, including this one, that PLA2R clearance happens well before proteinuria reduction. Here, Broganati followed patients, I think over 132 patients, who were treated with rituximab. And the PLA2R actually fell quite quickly, but proteinuria took a while to go down. And the authors found that a 50% reduction in anti-PLA2R preceded a 50% reduction in proteinuria by 10 months. So now we have the present understanding of the pathogenesis and the evolution of the various stages of disease from membranous nephropathy. Immunological activity happens months to years before there's a clinical manifestation of the nephrotic syndrome. And what that activity is, of course, is essentially the PLA2R antibody binding its antigen to PLA2R on the subepithelial aspect of the podocyte as immune complexes, which eventually lead to podocyte effacement and clinical disease. If we treat the PLA2R with immunosuppression, our hope is that we'll get the patient into immunologic remission. And then many months after, we expect to see clinical remission. So this understanding of disease has informed how we treat it today. Historically, based on KDU 2012, we could only treat clinically. We didn't have the marker of PLA2R. So we would have to wait six months of the nephrotic syndrome, not getting better. Then we start treatment. And then we continue treatment until they got into partial remission. Nowadays, with PLA2R, we can perhaps consider treating sooner and also ending sooner as well after we get immunological clearance, knowing that there's a delay between immunologic clearance and a clinical remission. And the KDEGO 2021 does say that. They say disappearance of anti-PLA2R antibodies precedes clinical remission and should lead to refraining from additional therapy. So to summarize this portion of the talk, you can use PLA2R for a non-invasive diagnosis of primary membranous nephropathy, assuming there's no secondary condition and assuming there's an intact kidney function. Patients with markedly elevated PLA2R titers are less likely to have spontaneous remissions. Earlier data suggested that it actually may predict more aggressive disease, but newer data suggests actually maybe a snapshot in time is not enough, and you really need to see what the PLA2R does over time to help predict how they're going to do with treatment. Um, lastly, immunologic remission precedes clinical remission by many months, and it has ramifications for when you can hold off further immunosuppression. So for this portion of the talk, I'd like to focus on rituximab versus the tried and true po modified Ponticelli. So we're deciding to treat, what do we use? So we know that cyclophosphamide works. We know that the modified Ponticelli regimen works. 70% remission rates, 90% dialysis free at 10 years. But we also know the toxicity of steroids, and we know the toxicity of cyclophosphamide, cytopenias, infections, secondary malignancies, hemorrhagic cystitis, infertility, nausea, and vomiting. Van de Brand wanted to compare how membranous patients fared from an adverse reaction perspective when using cyclophosphamide versus rituximab, and essentially found rituximab was more favorable. So now we'll turn our attention to treatment trials looking at rituximab versus uh, modified Ponticelli. Let's first focus on the rituximab trial. So the mentor trial was not the first rituximab trial. Gemrotux predated it, but it's probably the most famous, and it's the one that put rituximab on the map as one of the first immunosuppression therapies we use for membranous nephropathy. And, the top, and in the mentor trial, patients were randomized to receive either rituximab, one gram, two doses, every, uh, spread out by two weeks, and they received a follow-up six-month dose if um, they were only in partial remission versus cyclosporin over nine months. Um, oh, sorry, cyclosporin over 12 months. And the top line results is that their rituximab patients were much more likely to receive, to undergo a remission compared to the cyclosporin. It was a positive for rituximab. Cyclosporin did not look very good. And something that you'll note looking into the, uh, the tables in um, 
in the, uh, in the mentor trial is that these were higher risk patients. They had pretty significant nephrosis and they had higher PLA2R titers. The other thing you'll note is that while the top line data suggested that, you know, cyclosporin was far inferior than rituximab in terms of getting the patients into remission, cyclosporin did work a lot faster. Um, the, it didn't reach significance, but numerically, there were more remissions at six months in the cyclosporin group compared to rituximab. And that's not trivial. Nephrotic syndrome is a morbid disease. It, it, edema is very bothersome. Clotting is proportionate to how low your albumin is. Puts you at high risk of infection via immunoglobulin loss in the urine. So getting the patient into remission quickly is useful. So that actually opened up the uh, discussion for using CNI and rituximab in combination, which I'll talk about in a little bit. The other thing that's interesting in the mentor trial is that it was noted that patients who are in the highest level of PLA2R titer uh, seem to have less of a robust response either with an immunologic remission or clinical remission compared to the ones in lower titers. Now, this trend did not reach statistical significance other than one at one point here, but it is, a, it is something that got people thinking, wait a minute, for patients with very high PLA2R who might be at higher immunologic risk, is rituximab enough? And that was explored in several subsequent letters um, by a couple of groups. So one was by Van de Locht um, in KI in 2018. Uh, this group basically looked at how cyclophosphamide versus rituximab fared in two separate patient populations with different levels of PLA2R, the ones with the highest PLA2R titer in the rituximab group, none of them retrieved immunologic remission at six months, where the cyclophosphamide group did achieve immunologic remission a vast majority of the time in the higher titers. Now, some critiques of this study is that these are two different groups, one's from France, one's from the Netherlands, I believe, and also the rituximab antibodies were higher. But on a follow-up study to that, 10 of the patient, or 21 of the patients in the rituximab group were followed by this group and by were followed by Dahan and his team and Dahan's team. And essentially, what they found is, is that 10 patients d did not receive, did not achieve immunologic remission with upfront rituximab dosing. However, if they got a second course of rituximab, eight out of 10 of them did receive immunologic remission. So perhaps we could still use rituximab in these very high PLA2R titers, but maybe we need more and we have to give it more time. But really we want an answer of what's better between rituximab and modified Ponticelli, and there were a couple of RCTs trying to get to that answer. One was a Starman trial, um, and they essentially compared rituximab plus tacrolimus against modified Ponticelli, and the top line results were that there was much higher remission rates, 83% in the modified Ponticelli group versus the tacrolimus rituximab group. And the authors concluded the treatment of corticosteroid and cyclophosphamide induced remission is in a, induced remission in a significantly greater number of patients with primary MN than tacrolimus combined with rituximab. But there's been a lot of critiques of this trial. And those critiques are pretty evident when you look at the study design. So first of all, the rituximum tacrolimus group had a higher PLA2R levels compared to the modified Ponticelli. This did not, it, these, this was true certainly numerically. On statistical analysis, I think the P was point, point 0.1, so it, didn't, it wasn't statistically different, but numerically it was different. But really the critique is this. They only received one gram of rituximab where in Mentor, they received up to three grams. And in other studies, they actually received even up to four grams, since like some of the letters I showed you. So one critique of the study is that rituximab and tacrolimus didn't really get a fair shot compared to the modified Ponticelli. And indeed, there have been some single arm studies. This one's out of the NIH by, uh, by Waldman and uh, her colleagues. And they essentially looked at rituximab and cyclosporin, cyclosporin being given over a 24-month period, Ritux given at time zero, two grams, at time six months, two grams. And they found very high remission rates, and everyone achieved immunologic remission. This was a single-arm study, but gives some evidence, perhaps, that there is something there in terms of the Ritux CNI combination. The second large trial for Ritux versus modified Ponticelli was the Recyclo trial, and it was published a few years back. In this study, uh, patients were assigned to receive either rituximab one gram every two weeks times two or the modified Ponticelli over six months. 
Again, the rituximab group did not get a six-month dose, as they did in Mentor. Something else to note here is that these patients weren't as sick as the Mentor patients, as evidenced by lower proteinuria and lower PLA2R titers. And numerically, there was a greater response in the cyclical regimen compared to rituximab, but this did not reach statistical significance. Moreover, still, um, the, the, the Rituxx group did not get that six-month dose, so perhaps they weren't adequately, adequately dosed, and maybe it would have been tighter if they were. And the authors concluded there was no signal of more benefit or, or less harm associated with rituximab versus cyclo versus the cyclical regimen. But again, this is after 20 months of follow-up, and perhaps over a longer time period, you might see more, more differences in harm, for example, with modified Ponticelli. So here's another look at rituximab versus Ponticelli. And here we look at patients with higher immunological risk. They had higher PLA2R. This was observational. Fifth, there was a faster drop in proteinuria in the cyclophosphamide steroid group, which was significant. And there was a numerically faster drop in the PLA2R um, levels at six months, but that did not reach a statistical significance. Um, in terms of their hard outcome, their outcome at 18 months, there was numerically more remissions in the cyclical group compared to the rituximab group, which did not reach statistical significance. But again, only 37.5% in this group received a follow-up rituximab dosing. So again, maybe they were underdosed. However, there were more adverse events with cyclophosphamide steroid group compared to the rituximab group. So how do we put it all together? So there's a number of articles that have been published over the last couple of years. Both are sort of in a point-counterpoint um, motif. And um, one was out of Kinney 360 a couple of years ago. And then last year, there was one in CKJ where essentially they're weighing the pros and cons of rituximab versus cyclophosphamide, which I summarize here. Essentially what I'll say is that rituximab is a good first-line option for primary membranous, though we may need follow-up dosing. We may consider CNI to speed up remission, and it does seem to be slower compared to modified Ponticelli. So we may consider modified Ponticelli, particularly very high-risk patients, where the kidney function is going down and you don't have time to wait, or they have very high PLA2R levels, and they have very severe manifestations of the nephrotic syndrome, and you want to get them down quicker. Or they've tried rituximab and they're resistant to it. And KDGO would agree with this. They recommend for patients who are very high risk, which they define as life-threatening nephrotic syndrome, such as a pulmonary embolism, or declining kidney function, to go right to the modified Ponticelli. What do we do for patients who are resistant? Disease, who are with resistant disease. Essentially, what KDGO would suggest is that if you started off with modified Ponticelli, you would go to rituximab and vice versa. But if you do that and you still have resistance, which is not simply persistent proteinuria, but it would be ongoing immunologic um, activity, uh, persistently positive PLA2R, um, you should consult an expert center. So what are some of the proposed mechanisms of rituximab resistance in membranous nephropathy? Um, this is the other counterpoint, point, counterpoint article I was referring to in CKJ 2023, and they postulate a couple of theories for why rituximab may not work for membranous. One is insufficient dosing, which we've alluded to um, in a couple, of, a couple of times already. One is when you have very severe nephrosis, you can actually have rituximab is a protein. It's an antibody. It's a protein. You can have rituximab loss in the urine. Thirdly, you can have the development of human antichimeric antibodies. Rituximab is part mouse, and about 20 to 40 percent of patients can actually develop anti-rituximab antibodies, which limits the efficacy of rituximab. Uh, fourthly, you can have insufficient B cell depletion in the bone marrow or lymph nodes or other tissues, so you measure in the blood, CD19 might be very low, might be undetectable, but you don't know what's going on in the bone marrow or the lymph nodes. And then lastly, for the vast majority of membranous patients, the theory is, is that PLR2, PLA2R is being, anti-PLA2R is being elaborated by short-lived plasma cells, which are derived from CD20-positive B cells, which will be targeted by rituximab. However, if that shifts over to plasma cells, which are CD20-negative, well, then rituximab is not going to work. So actually, Dr. Asotelu, who's in the audience, um, when he was working with Dr. Agawal, actually published um, a, a poster, present, uh, pu presented a poster in ASN looking at a patient with resist, uh, with, looking at a patient with rituximab resistance. And this patient essentially was given rituximab doses, but the PLA2R was not falling. And when they checked for anti-rituximab antibody, it was quite high. 
So they shifted their therapy away from rituximab and moved to second generation um, anti-CD20 therapy or obinutuzumab. And with that, they had clinically did much better and they had immunologic remission so we could predict would continue to do better in the future. And this has been published elsewhere. Um, uh, uh, this, have, uh, this has been published also. The Toronto group um, published in Kidney International Reports. And essentially, they followed eight patients with rituximab resistance, and four of them had positive anti-rituximab antibodies. They received either obinutuzumab or rifatinumab, which were fully humanized, so you wouldn't get uh, human antichimeric antibodies to them, and the patients had a ni nice immunologic response. The ones who did not have anti-rituximab antibody received for the rituxx and did well. Still, using the KD KDGO 2021 recommended therapies, Rituxx or modified Ponticelli, you're still looking at only a remission rate of 60 to 70-ish percent. Um, so there still is a ways to go, and uh, luckily we have some clinical trials looking to see how we can improve remission rates. And this is a list of some of the clinical trials currently recruiting, including one at Northwestern, um, where we're st where Biogene is sponsoring it, where we're looking at the safety and efficacy of xenobrutinib, which is a novel bertine bert tyrosine kinase anti-B cell therapy, comparing it to tacrolimus. And we are actively recruiting. So again, if you have patients, please let either myself or Pat know um, we are recruiting. So let's go back and conclude the cases. So regarding our building engineer who had high risk members of nephropathy, a kidney biopsy was pursued by his primary nephrologist. I agree with that because the GFR was less than 60. Initially treated with two doses of rituximab, and then the pilator did not drop and he was referred to me. I checked an anti-rituximab antibody, it was negative. Because he was a high risk patient, kidney function was going down. I felt like we didn't have time to wait. We reviewed the risks and benefits of modified Ponticelli. He agreed. With modified Ponticelli, he did have a nice immunologic response with the PLA2R dropping 90%, but it's not negative. He still has ongoing activity. His creatinine has stabilized from 1.7 to 1.9. His albumin is going up, but he still is quite nephrotic. And we're um, considering him for the Biogene trial after the uh, modified Ponticelli washes out. For our second case, the tax consultant with um, high-risk membranous nephropathy based on uh, the fact that PLA2R is going up, with more bothersome edema, we elected to defer a kidney biopsy, started him on tacrolimus, and we gave him rituximab up front, and in six months, tacrolimus is now off. He is in a stable partial remission on his way to a complete remission, and most importantly, he feels great. Lastly is our elementary school principal, who is very different than all the other patients I described here. He actually has secondary membranous, secondary to the NSAIDs. We treated him conservatively. He never received immunosuppression. And his last lab showed a complete remission. And actually, I, I met this patient in 2022. In 2023, Sethi actually published the PCSK9 antigen, which is the antigen associated with NSAID associated membranes. So it would have been interesting to see if he would have seen positive for that. If you look at the patients in that study, seven out of 13 patients were treated conservatively, and nearly everyone reached remission. So his favorable prognosis is like what's published in the literature. And briefly to end, I can't give a talk on membranous in 2024 without paying homage to the great work of Dr. Sethi and colleagues in elucidating many of the autoantigens responsible for membranous nephropathy. Um, late last year, Sethi and colleagues published a consensus report recommending to classify membranous nephropathy by the autoantigen antibody um, causing the membranous as opposed to saying simply primary or secondary. So old way, we called membranous as primary or secondary based on what secondary condition we have, but now we're in the age of antigens. And while just starting with PLA-2R, now we've, Dr. Sethi and his team and others have essentially elucidated 90% of all MN cases. They've been able to identify the culprit antigen antibody relationship or pair. And that's significant because a lot, of these relation, a lot of these antigens are linked to certain disease associations, such as NSAIDs, FAT1 and stem cells, exosomes one 2 and autoimmune disease, thrombospondin 7A and malignancies. Which begs the question, in the future, will there be a membranous serum panel? Instead of just sending anti pili 2 r will you be able to send off anti-NL1, anti-thrombospondin 7A, et cetera? A membranous antibody serum panel. And if we do get there, will these antibodies be 
will prove to be as useful as PLA-2R in terms of diagnosing, prognosticating, guiding treatment decisions, we'll see. So, by way of summary, um, membranous nephropathy is a common primary glomerulopathy with two-thirds of patients not entering a spontaneous remission. There is a higher risk of progression of kidney failure if patients remain nephrotic and they should be offered treatment. While biopsy historically was necessary to, to diagnose membranous, we can now defer biopsy among certain patients with positive PLA-2R serologies, um, preserved kidney function, and not having a secondary condition such as diabetes, monoclonopathy, autoimmune disease. We can use PLR2R trends to guide immunosuppression decisions. Options for immunosuppression include rituximab plus or minus CNI versus the modified Ponticelli. Um, I'm, wary of use, I'm wary of using calcium inhibition as monotherapy because of the high relapse rate when you come off the CNI. Modified Ponticelli still, think, still has a role in primary membranous nephropathy, even in the rituximab age, particularly with the very high-risk patients with declining kidney function or with very high PLA2R titers that are among patients who are very symptomatic and you want to get the titers down more quickly. And lastly, among truly resistant patients, always consider a clinical trial referral, such as ours. Also, you should, um, also it's reasonable to check for human antichimeric um, antibodies, and if they're positive, considering a second-generation fully humanized anti-CD20, such as obinutuzumab. And that is my talk, and thanks for everyone's attention, and happy opening up for questions and discussion.